I'd like to welcome everyone to the Vasculitis Foundation webinar today. I'm Kathy Olevsky, the host for the Vasculitis Foundation educational webinar series. And I'm also a patient living with MPA vasculitis. And today's webinar is a quiz about vasculitis with the intention of educating all of us just a little bit more. And we're grateful to have Dr. Kevin Byram with us today to educate us and answer some questions. The webinars are part of the Vasculitis Foundation's commitment to patient education, and we would like to thank Amgen for sponsoring Vasculitis Awareness Month and helping us to present this webinar today. We're going to review the connection between types of vasculitis and FDA-approved treatments in the form of a quiz. So before we get started, I'd like to take a second and introduce our guest, Dr. Kevin Byram is the director of the Vanderbilt Vasculitis Clinic. He's an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Rheumatology at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine in Nashville, Tennessee, and he's also the board president for the Vasculitis Foundation. So Dr. Byram, I know you're so busy and I appreciate so much you giving us the time today to do our quiz with us. Of course, I just uh, appreciate you guys including me in this. All righty, I think I will start by sharing my screen so that we can do this great quiz today. And here we are. I just wanna say that the theme today is connections and this is a short quiz for everybody to take along with us about the connection between types of vasculitis and FDA approved treatments. And this is all part of Vasculitis Awareness Month. So uh, having started with that, let's start with our first question. Uh, let's see, the FDA has approved IVIG for which type of vasculitis? And the answer is Kawasaki disease. Uh, Dr. Byron, can you tell us more about IVIG? What is it? What is it? How does it treat vasculitis? Sure, of course. It's um it's an unusual product in many ways. It's a it's a product of pooled immunoglobulin, which are the protective antibodies that we all produce. Um, any individual batch has uh, a number of individuals um, uh, immunoglobulins in it, and we've got very good evidence, uh, as published in our ACRVF guidelines for treatment for Kawasaki's disease, that. Um, uh, IVIG is effective in treating treating that uh, form of vasculitis. It, that's a form of vasculitis that we really only see in pediatric populations, but it's uh, it, it has been shown that IVIG can really help that that disease. So it's become standard of care, and uh, many patients, of course, with that disease get that treatment. Well, it's great to get that information because I hear people mention that from time to time. Mm -hmm. All right, moving to the next question. The FDA approved a vacapan for the treatment of which types of vasculitis? And the answers are granulomatosis with polyangitis, known as GPA, and microscopic polyangitis, which is MPA. And uh, patients are often confused about a vacapan being an, an induction drug. And if I understand it correctly, it doesn't actually replace steroids, but Maybe you could explain what it means to be an induction drug and what a vacapan is actually supposed to be for. Sure, these are all very good, uh, good questions. So we think about induction therapy as being the initial rather intense therapy that patients undergo to get control of their disease. It usually is the first three to six months of treatment. And um, the Advocate trial actually was the trial that showed that a vacapan is effective when combined with standard of therapy, standard of care therapy, um, namely rituximab or cyclophosphamide for the treatment of moderate to severe ANCA associated vasculitis. And in that trial, it was shown that, that yes, while avacapan doesn't totally replace all of the initial steroids that a patient can get, um, which can be a lot um, in a patient with ANCA vasculitis, it can replace a good deal of them. And so it, it has been one of the tools that we use to use less steroids uh, in the initial treatment of patients with vasculitis. And in many ways, it's become a form of uh, a, a, an addition to standard of care. I think most patients with moderate to severe, new diagnoses of moderate to severe ankylvasculitis, uh, avacapan becomes a, a good option to combine with the others. Okay, thanks for clearing that up. I, I actually see that 
questions about that frequently in the social media groups. So I'm sure this will help. And moving along to our next question. Uh, oh, well, first I wanted to say that I want to remind everybody that you can connect with the vasculitis uh, foundation to learn more about treatments for vasculitis. There's a, a page on the Vasculitis Foundation website all about treating vasculitis, and I encourage patients to go there and learn more. You can find all the current treatment guidelines published there, as well as links to webinars about treatment and shared decision-making with your doctors. Now for the next question, which of the following two types of vasculitis are ANCA-associated vasculitis, otherwise known in short language as AAV? And the answers are MPA and GPA. Um, I just want to say that when I was first diagnosed with MPA, I thought all forms of vasculitis were ANCA associated. So maybe you can help us understand this a little more. Sure. This is, um, it, it's a confusing area. There's a lot of different types of vasculitis. It depends on who you ask how many different types there are. But we also know that there are certain types of vasculitis associated with different infections in medicines. And so once you start um, thinking about that, there's just, there's a lot of different ways vasculitis can occur. And one of the ways we think about this is the size of vessel that's involved, the small vessel vasculitis, medium vessel vasculitis, large vessel vasculitis. And again, there's a little bit of overlap between these certain things, but uh, um, we think of the prototypical small vessel vasculitis syndromes as being those ANCA associated vasculitis diseases the MPA, GPA, and there's actually a, a third sister of the diseases called eGPA or eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, also known as the Church-Strauss syndrome. So all of these have been shown to be associated with the antibody that we call ANCA, which is an anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody, and it helps aid in the diagnosis of these. So those three, the two listed here, and then the Church-Strauss syndrome are the ones that have been really associated with that antibody. Okay, thank you for helping us with that. And the next question is about large vessels since we were just talking about that. So large vessels are affected in these types of vasculitis. And let's look at the next slide and see which ones. That would be aeritis, GCA or giant cell arteritis, polymyalgia rheumatica known as PMR, and Takayasu's arteritis, which is often called TAC. And um, I've, I've actually... Can you tell us about, I wondered if you could tell us about body systems and organs that are affected by large vessel vasculitis. We often hear about the types, but don't know exactly what that means to our, our body. Mm -hmm. This is why it's helpful to think in terms of the size of vessel that's involved because it correlates with the types of symptoms or manifestations that the patient might have. So when the largest blood vessel in the body, the aorta or its branches, are affected, that presents in a much different way than patients with small vessel vasculitis like GPA and MPA. So in patients with Takayasu's arteritis, PMR, GCA, or aortitis, that aorta inflammation can cause a lot of different systems, uh, symptoms like chest pain, uh, difficulty breathing. If the branches of the aorta going to the head are involved, people can have cranial symptoms like headaches, vision changes, uh, dizziness and things like that. So that's why the size, that's why we harp so much on the size of the blood vessel is because it helps us identify which disease we might be dealing with. Okay. Well, that makes perfect sense to me. And now I'm sure you've seen this slide many times. Most vasculitis patients should have seen it by now, but I thought I would bring it up to just review large, medium, and small vessel vasculitis. Maybe you can go over it with us a bit. Yeah, this is really good timing based on some of these questions and topics we've talked about so far. So here uh, you can see the large vessel vasculitis syndromes that we discussed, Takayasu's and giant cell arteritis. You can see uh, the small vessel vasculitis syndromes of which what I call the three sisters are listed, MPA, GPA, and EGPA. You can see there's other diseases that affect small and medium vessels as well. And then we see Kawasaki's disease, which we had a question about in terms of IVIG. So this, again, this is a very famous slide uh, from a conference back in 2011, 2012, that helped kind of wrap our heads around the different uh, types of vasculitis, the vessels involved, and how these things uh, present in, in any individual patient. 
Okay, yes, and as I said, we've seen it several times. Uh, let's see, the next question is about uh, GCA or giant cell arteritis. Is most closely associated what, with what other type of vasculitis? And the answer is, well, I went past it somehow. <laughs> Yeah. Let me see. There it is. Polymyalgia, polymyalgia rheumatica or PMR, as most right. people call it. And can you maybe just review some of the commonalities when patients have both GCA and PMR? I know not all GCA patients have PMR, but just maybe you could review that a little. Sure. Yeah. PMR is uh, can be a tough clinical situation. It's an inflammatory kind of periarthritis of both shoulders and both hips with elevated inflammatory markers. Patients with a history of PMR, they are at some risk for developing giant cell arteritis. And some people think it's actually a kind of a, a subacute presentation of giant cell arteritis based on some fancy imaging studies like PET scans and MRIs that show hidden aortitis or inflammation of large vessels uh, in patients with PMR. That might not otherwise have symptoms. So there is a very closely related um, uh, or a close relationship between those two. And when you see one, you have to have your eye out for the other. Okay, thanks. Moving on to the next one, which I just went to a minute ago. Uh, people from the Mediterranean, the Middle East, and Asia are most likely to get this type of vasculitis. And you see the choices on the right. And the answer is Bichette's disease. And I've heard Bichette's disease called the Silk Road disease, which I found fascinating. And I wonder if you can explain a little bit about this ethnicity and maybe some historical information about the Silk Road disease name. Sure. Yeah. Bichette's disease is a very interesting disease. Um, and you're right. It's known as the Silk Road disease based on the fact that it is more common among ethnicities that are along the old Silk Road perhaps with the highest prevalence in patients uh, in and around Turkey. Um, that's where the biggest Bichette's clinics in the world are. It's a, it's, an, it's a tough disease because there's no overt blood test for it. There are genetic risk factors and things like that. And there are a lot of mimics to this. Um, and so it's important to, you know, if this is a diagnosis that's being considered, that you uh, see someone skilled in being able to kind of pick out if this is the right disease or if something like lupus, inflammatory bowel disease, um, or even an infection could be causing the symptoms. Um, but it's a very, very interesting disease. As are many of the forms of vasculitis. They are. And having said that, I just want to let everyone know that you can visit the Vasculitis Foundation website and under education, you can learn these facts and others about the various forms of vasculitis. As a matter of fact, after you've read all about your form of vasculitis, you can go to the resources tab and under order print, you can actually find short documents that you can print out for family or even take to your primary care doctor's office, which is what I did yesterday. I printed out the uh, MPA information and the general vasculitis information. And my doctor was actually, he was pretty happy. He said, can I keep these? And I said, sure. It was just, he wanted to educate the other doctors in the office. So I think that's always great for us to know. And then let's move on to the next question. May is known as, and there's a lot of choices here, and you may be surprised to know that it's all of them. <laughs> so in addition to International Drum Month and all of the others, it is Vasculitis Awareness Month, which is super important to all of us. And I want you to know because of that, since it's known as Vasculitis Awareness Month, there are things that we would like you to do we would, uh, all of these things are, all those previous things are listed as campaigns, but this is the one we most find most important for all of us. And I would like you to watch uh, on the Joshua Roberts video. He's an eGPA patient and our featured spring appeal patient. And he represents the power of connections. I watched his video the other day. You can find it on the Vasculitis Foundation YouTube channel. Um, it's on all over social media right now. And it's an amazing story of how he got connected with the Vasquez Foundation and how much that helped him um, come back from a pretty bad place with his disease. 
Uh, you can also review our all of our 2025 Community Hero winners. There's all sorts of great content there that I would love everybody to see. I'd like you to join another educational webinar. We do these to help our patients and um, they're very inspiring, many of them, and very educational. Oops. And uh, please share your story on social media with the hashtag VAM2025 to help spread awareness. Uh, we'd love for you to connect with other patients in the support groups. You can find information about that on the Vasculitis Foundation website. Please donate to our spring appeal to support the VF's programs and initiatives. And I just also wanted to show you, you can actually, uh, I'm going to click on this link and see if I can get to it. Oh, yes, the Vasculitis Foundation's Awareness Month t-shirt. So quickly order that so you have it during Vasculitis Foundation uh, Month. And let's see if I can get back to, <laughs> see if I can get back to our, there we are. And then um, just to say thank you so much to Dr. Kevin Byram for taking your time to help educate us today and answer all our questions and to the Vasculitis Foundation for always supporting these educational webinars. And we have a sponsor for Vasculitis Awareness Month, Amgen, and we'd like to thank them for that too. And Dr. Byram, do you have any thoughts to add at the end of our quiz today? Just thanks again for including me. This is a very important month for the Vasculitis Foundation in terms of increasing awareness amongst patients and providers. Um, uh, about vasculitis and the Vasculitis Foundation as a resource. You've highlighted a lot of great resources that the VF puts out for uh, patient education and advocacy. So thanks again for including me. Thank you.